protect your DNA. BioPQQ can promote formation of new mitochondria. InfoWarsStore.com Joining us tonight is Jim Girock. Now, Jim was a former prosecutor in Chicago. I wanted to talk to him about what we learned in Homan Square. Of course, it has roots in the war on drugs. And for the last 20 years, Jim Garrock has been fighting drug prohibition. He's part of a group, Law Enforcement Against Prohibition. Actually, he is the executive board vice chairman. And before we go to Jim, I want to read you a quote from him. He says, ironically, the war on drugs was put in place to save our kids from drugs and to make our streets safer. But ending prohibition is what will truly accomplish these goals. Joining us now is Jim Girock. Thank you for joining us, Jim. David, my pleasure to be with you. Now, I wanted to talk to you especially today because there's a, a UN event coming up next uh, week. I think a lot of people don't realize the historical involvement of the United Nations in the war on drugs. You're going to be going there to try to change the course of uh, the approach that is, is being I guess an agenda that's being forced on us from the top down, but also because of what we saw this last week with the Guardian story talking about Home and Square, uh, the site where there was it was alleged that people were held for very long periods of time without being booked, uh, some cases of torture. And at first when I looked at this, Jim, I thought, is this the NDAA being put into practice? But then as we looked at how the Guardian found this site, what they had was a Chicago detective, uh, Richard Zuli who was involved in some of the more egregious torture incidents at Gitmo, and, the, and tracking that back, they found that he had a pretty bad record in Chicago, and that led them to this site. So uh, it kind of looks to me like this is something that uh, actually began with the war on drugs, like so many uh, kinds of corruption that we've seen in this country. Well, David, let me say that uh, there's nothing better than a good cop, and there's nothing worse than a bad cop. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, and, and, and what we have done is we have perverted the police mission that used to be to serve and protect and help people. And we've converted it into a war on drugs where we try to catch people involved in consensual uh, adult activity, criminalized it. Uh, and as a result, we have uh, so many human rights violations, uh, uh, rules that used to mean something, the sanctity of uh, the home, uh, now being uh, bulldozed with battering rams and drug police trying to catch the, get you, catch you with the drugs before you flush the toilet. Mm -hmm. uh, Chicago also has a horrible history, uh, not only from a prohibition standpoint with Al Capone and, and alcohol, but also a Lieutenant Burge who ran a torture crew here in Chicago. Uh, uh, many... Uh, tens of millions of dollars in settlements being paid for, for torturing people, uh, putting a, a royal typewriter cover over the head uh, of an inmate to suffocate him. Mm. Uh, uh, they used a cattle uh, prod, uh, attaching them to the genitals of, of uh, su suspects in order to, to get them to confess the crimes, often cases which they didn't commit. Yeah. So. We, we have a sordid, uh, sad history here in Chicago, which uh, is being discussed uh, uh, as a result of this article uh, in The Guardian. And, and it did mention that particular officer as well in The Guardian uh, article. They also had a quote from Mark Fallon, who's former deputy commander of Gitmo's now shuttered investigative tax, task force. He said that uh, Richard Zuli's interrogation of one suspect was, quote, illegal, immoral, ineffective, and unconstitutional. But that kind of describes also the war on drugs, doesn't it, Jim? I'm, I'm afraid to say. Well, it, it certainly does. The, the, the despicable war on drugs is the heart of nearly any crisis that you can name. One of the crises is the excessive use of force by police. Yes. Uh, the, the immunity and impunity that attaches to police misconduct that is so bad in the United States that we have had President Obama com, uh, put together a task force on 21st century policing, whose report is due here in a couple of days, the preliminary report. Uh, LEAP, Law Enforcement Against Prohibition that I'm associated with, sent a statement saying that the one reform more important than, than any other is calling for an end to the war on drugs that, that leads to excessive force. 
to the militarization of the police department, to the corruption of police, to the license for police to use excessive force with impunity. Uh, so many people are complaining about the grand jury doesn't work, that, uh, that uh, we need civilian review boards, that we need to wear cameras on the bodies of police officers, uh, that, that we, we need training reforms, uh, uh, so many reforms. But all of these misconduct is aggravated because of this license to act like a bad guy with a badge and with a gun uh, because of our war on drugs. Yeah, there's a lot of perverse incentives in it. I didn't really start paying attention to the war on drugs. Uh, it really kind of, from an American standpoint, I guess people could say it started when Richard Nixon declared a war on drugs, and then uh, they created the DEA a couple of years later. I started paying attention when they went into civil asset forfeiture, essentially taking away our right to due process and incentivizing theft from bad cops, incentivizing police departments to fund their departments by just seizing property, never charging the owners with a crime, never going through any due process. And then, of course, shortly after that, also under Reagan, they came up with the mandatory minimums, which completely destroyed uh, the judicial system, judicial discretion, and I think justice. And that, that's so much of a, a part of the prisons that we have that are bursting at the seams, the incarceration rate that we have in this country that is so much higher. But, Jim, when I started looking at this, I, I, I was surprised when the UN came out and, and attacked the states like Colorado and Washington that had passed recreational marijuana laws. And I was kind of taken back. It's like, uh, well, why are they getting involved in this? I didn't understand that they've been involved in this long before it happened here in the US. Give us a little bit of that history, going back to what you're going to uh, next week is actually something that began back in 1946, isn't it? The Commission on Narcotic Drugs? The Commission on Narcotic Drugs meets once a year in, uh, in Vienna, which is one of the headquarters for the United Nations. And, and it's just the job of the Commission on Narcotic Drugs to provide for drug policy for the world within the confines of three uh, drug prohibition treaties. The first treaty is called the 1961 Single Convention on Narcotic Drugs. That is the fundamental foundational treaty that says that drug use around the world is outlawed uh, unless it's for medicinal or scientific purposes. And yet we know that there are many people who use drugs uh, who, that, that, that are used recreationally. And as a result, we have 162 to 324 million people aged 15 to 64, representing three and a half percent to 7% of the people of the world who are annually criminalized because of this prohibition system. The United Nations and these three prohibition treaties are the fountainhead of drug prohibition for the world. Yeah. It is the United Nations that's the fountainhead for drug prohibition. And, and as a consequence of that, in 1970, uh, the United States passed the Controlled Substances Act. The following year, 1971, uh, Nixon declared a war on drugs. At that time, we had 300,000 people behind bars in the United States. After 40, well, how many years is that? Uh, we, we, we now have- 44 uh, years, yeah, 44, 45, yeah, go ahead. We now have 2.2 million people behind bars because of the crazy war on drugs. Yeah. Ba basically, half the people in prison there for, for drugs uh, offenses. And when they started mandatory minimums back in 1986, they couldn't build the prisons quickly enough. They were letting violent criminals out so they could lock people up for 10 years because they had, they were growing some pot in their closet. And because of the quantity of pot, even if they were a first offender, even if they were nonviolent, they had to be sent to jail for 10 years. So they were letting the violent criminals go in our country. I think that's very interesting. I think most people don't realize, Jim, just as you laid it out here, back in 1961 when they changed the rules on narcotic drugs and basically extended it, they'd done some controls of uh, opium-based and coca-based drugs, but then they kind of extended it. They created these kind of drug schedules that we now see. You know, people talk about marijuana yeah. being a Schedule One drug. And Correct. it was 10 years later that that UN agenda became the American War on Drugs. I think that's very amazing. And I think it's interesting that the UN is now getting involved criticizing Uruguay because Uruguay has become the first nation state to uh, say that they're not going to, they're going to legalize marijuana broad based. So the UN came after them. The UN has criticized American states. We had, of course, Colorado and Washington just this, uh, just last week. It was a week, about a week ago, I think it was, that 
Alaska's law on prohibiting recreational use of marijuana became effective. So they're coming after all of those states. And so I, I guess, uh, Jim, where do you see this uh, headed with the UN? What is, how are they going to try to enforce that since they don't have any UN police? <laughs> the, 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 the United Nations has, has these treaties. And the treaties exist because the nations of the world agreed to, to be a part of the treaties. Mm -hmm. The United States, Russia, China, uh, India, um, Sweden, countries that often don't agree on much of anything, agree on the war on drugs. And, and as a consequence, uh, the nations of the world were required by this 1961 treaty to go home and to criminalize the recreational use of drugs. Mm -hmm. And, and to provide for the incarceration and deprivation of freedom of people who violated the rules. As a consequence of that, the Controlled Substances Act was adopted by the United States Congress. The states replicated the federal system and put in statewide prohibition, and the nations of the world followed suit and did the same thing, which created havoc around the world that increased drug availability, that reduced the price of drugs. Uh, that that created addiction, that made people use drugs in the dark because you can't read the label to see what's on it because the irony of prohibition is that when you prohibit something, you give up the right to control and regulate it. Absolutely. And drugs are too dangerous not to control and regulate. So LEAP, Law Enforcement Against Prohibition, is going to the United Nations on Monday. And, and we, along with the Czech Republic, will be presenting a side event, which is titled um, Treaty Amendment, a, a Choice for Drug Policy Reform. And, and it is essential that the nations of the world wake up and demand an end to this crazy war on drugs that kills in Mexico 100,000 people, 10,000 10, people a year. That, that resulted in 60 tons of meth being seized worldwide last year, that resulted one, in 100 new synthetic drugs being invented last year that are being created so quickly by drug cartels because they're not against the law if you just invented it, that, that, that we can't add them to the, the prohibition schedules you mentioned fast enough. Yeah, it's, it's, that's a good example, meth, I think, because we see in that what we saw in the original drug prohibition, alcohol prohibition. We saw that there were very dangerous forms of alcohol created, uh, things that, would, that were far more dangerous than regular alcohol. And of course, the concentrations went up. It was a boon for organized crime because they had a monopoly on the black market. It corrupted the police. But now our war on drugs has been going on much, much longer than that. That only lasted about 14 years. Now, like you pointed out, we've been going on this for 45 years. And they took a different approach with this uh, in the 1980s. Reagan started coming after end users instead of essentially going after the Al Capones. He went after everybody in the speakeasies, locking them up with mandatory minimums. And so it's, it's become much more pervasive. It's metastasized into many more forms, become much worse because of the additional length of time. Basically, your approach is to go to the fountainhead of the war on drugs, the UN, and to say we don't need to be taking this law enforcement approach to a drug addiction problem. Is that correct? Uh, correct. Instead of a one-size-fits-all, where then all the nations of the world must speak with a single prohibition voice, instead we want to give the nations of the world the right to put in place drug policies which will work in their country, that will replace the prohibition criminalization system with, with a system that cares about health, uh, that cares about human rights, that reduces incarceration, that increases freedom, that, that convinces people that we recognize as the governments of the world that we cannot prevent you from using drugs if you choose to. We can't keep drugs out of a controlled prison environment. And, and how do we expect to keep it out of a free society in the world? People themselves have to use discretion and choose not to use drugs. Not because the government says you can't, but because we as individuals choose not to. And if you do try decide you're going to use drugs, which we don't recommend, then at least they should be controlled and regulated so you're not killing yourself because you don't know what the heck is in the package. Because government, when they outlaw drugs, give up the right to regulate who's going to sell it, where it will be sold, the conditions of sale, 
How strong did, can, can the drug be? And you can't you can't mandate naloxin be sold along with a dose of heroin when, when you outlaw heroin in the first place, and, and you can't even make a labeling law. You made a connection between uh, the kind of proposals that you're talking about and the way we approach tobacco. We understand that tobacco is addictive. We understand that it's very harmful for your health. But instead of taking a law enforcement approach like we did with alcohol, like we have done with all these other drugs, we took a different approach. Talk about that a little bit, because that's part of your proposal to the UN, isn't it? Uh, well, I mean, right now, the two most dangerous drugs in the world uh, are alcohol and tobacco, both of which are legal. One of the things that we have suggested is that alcohol and tobacco should be controlled and regulated um, uh, and, and a part of, of the overall view of, of uh, drugs regulated by the, by the world community through the United Nations. Uh, and that each year these, these drugs should be listed and scheduled to show which is the one that's killing the most people. So keep, people can better appreciate uh, what, what is a dangerous drug uh, and, and, and what is killing the most people. Yes, absolutely. And of course, Putting marijuana in as a Schedule One drug is essentially saying that it doesn't have any medicinal uses, and we know that that's not true flat out. It's an absurdity. Yes. And when you take three and a half to seven percent of the world population who are using a controlled substance in, in violation of the rules, it, it shows an international disrespect for the law. Just just as the Controlled Substances Act in the United States shows a disrespect. Uh, and, and the violation of it, a disrespect for law enforcement. People Absolutely. don't respect it when when the police are are policing for profit to, to basically hijack the profits of the drug gangs to take the, the money, the cash, the cars, the real estate and convert it to their own use with half going to the feds and half going to the local law enforcement agency. How can you respect something like that? Absolutely. When you rough, rough the kid up and when you stop and frisk somebody, when you arrest blacks 48 times the rate at which you, you arrest whites, how can law enforcement in that mission be respected? It's not. And it leads to this horrible policing and violations and excess force and, and the, uh, the 391 program, I believe, is where the Pentagon delivers its tanks to local law enforcement so we can have episodes like we saw in Ferguson uh, uh, yes. uh, just a while ago. Yes, absolutely. Now, in terms of talking about this, in terms of talking even about the legal authority for this, I think it's set up a real interesting case, these uh, state uh, uh, initiatives, these laws that have legalized the recreational use of marijuana. I think that sets up a very interesting uh, case. And as a former prosecutor and lawyer, I'd like to get your take on it because we've got now states that have said uh, in violation of what the federal government has been saying for 40 years, they said, no, we're not going to uh, arrest people who are rec recreationally using marijuana. And you've got the feds pushing back on it. You've got some states in particular, Oklahoma and Nebraska, are asking the Supreme Court to weigh in and use the supremacy clause in a way that I think is not valid. I think we had... Uh, two amendments in the Constitution, the Ninth and Tenth Amendment, that made it pretty clear that unless the power was explicitly given to the federal government to regulate something, they didn't have that power. It was reserved to the people in the states. And I think that was recognized in the 18th Amendment and the 21st Amendment, where they prohibited alcohol. They said they needed to have a constitutional amendment because they didn't have that inherent power under some supremacy clause, and then had to have another amendment to take that out. So how do you see this playing out legally within the United States? Because while you're going to the United Nations, the source of where this agenda has come and trying to change the approach there, you've got people in the states who are saying, we're going to exercise our 10th Amendment rights and we're not going to send people to prison while other states are trying to appeal this to the Supreme Court. How do you see this shaking out legally? Well, well I think it's wonderful uh, that we've got these referendums that are passing where, where the people themselves are saying that our drug laws are so bad that we are going to defy federal law and we are going to legalize, for example, cannabis. Uh, cannabis people know for a long time is a medicine, yet the federal government under its laws says it's not a medicine. Well, we got little kids with seizures multiple times a day that can be helped with cannabis, but yes. but but we've outlawed it. Mm -hmm. So the, the the dichotomy between federal and state law um, uh, it, it is a is a long time historical uh, uh, part of of, of our uh, government in the United States.
And the president has been wise enough to recognize where the people themselves exercising their authority under state law, they, they legalize a, a substance. We're not going to use federal resources to come in and imprison or try and trump local state law. That's at least a step in, in the correct direction. I, I see this playing out with, with the war on drugs coming to a quick conclusion because the people realize it doesn't work. Yeah. The difficulty is law enforcement and, and parents and teachers and responsible people, drug treaters, are some of the most difficult people to convince, yeah. even though if you ask somebody, does the war on drugs work? I mean, you're going to get at least nine out of 10 that are going to say absolutely not. Yes. But it's a harder question to convince somebody to use their head and recognize that these things are too dangerous to leave uncontrolled. Yes. From the beginning of time, people have used illicit substances and they're going to to the end of time. So rather than criminalize and, 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 and harass a, a, a world of people, let's control and regulate drugs and try to reduce the harm, reduce the number of in peace people incarcerated, stop rewarding police for, uh, for, for getting one person to rat on another person instead of uh, relying on the golden rule that we once upon a time used. No, oh, absolutely. It's just corrupted us in so many different ways systemically. And I'm, I'm hoping that people are going to stand up at the state level, assert their 10th Amendment rights, stand for their, their individual rights as, as human beings, support each other in juries, not convict each other. We've had a lot of cases of jury nullification of people who uh, were charged with possessing large amounts of uh, marijuana, and they and had the jurors have, let them go. We now have executive uh, nullification in effect, yeah. where, where things are so bad, the Attorney General Eric Holder is saying, uh, U.S. attorneys don't charge people with, with these these drug crimes that have mandatory minimums where we got to send them away forever in a nonviolent drug offense. Well, as you pointed out, it's an information war. It's something we have to convince. A, a lot of people who are in responsible positions just cannot see even the precedent that we had with our failed experiment with prohibition at the beginning of last century. And so now we're doomed to repeat it again, even though it's been failing now for close to 50 years. Thank you so much, Jim Girock, Law Enforcement Against Prohibition. I wish you the best in taking it to the source of the drug war, to the United Nations. I, I thank you for speaking truth to power, and uh, I hope you are successful in getting them to change their priorities at that level. David, thank you for letting Leap uh, bring this message to you and your listeners. Thank you so and much, you. Jim. Thank you. Bye-bye. Well, it's very important for people to go to the United Nations like uh, Jim Girak is doing. Make the case that we need to approach this differently, not as a law enforcement problem, but as a drug addiction problem. Still, we need to understand that we have the rights under the Ninth and Tenth Amendment to make these decisions at the state level and even at the individual level with our juries. We need to understand that there was no constitutional authority and there remains no constitutional authority to prohibit anything. That's why we had the 18th and the 21st Amendments, because everybody 100 years ago understood that those powers were not possessed by the federal government. So they're not something that can be turned over to a treaty. But as Jim points out, it's not being enforced by the UN. The UN is just a collection of nations who are saying, well, you know, we all agreed that we're going to run this uh, drug prohibition war. So you're part of the club, do it. And they say, oh, don't twist my arm behind my back, because it's a very effective way for governments to control the population. And we know how involved our government is on both sides of the war on drugs, both as a prosecutor and as a supplier. Well, that's it for tonight. If you are watching us on YouTube, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. If you're not a Prison Planet TV subscriber, please consider becoming a subscriber and financially supporting our operation. Your contribution, your membership, your subscription will allow you to watch the news every weeknight as it happens. And it will also give you and 20 people access to all of Alex Jones's documentaries. Well, that's it for tonight. Please join us again tomorrow night at 7 Central, 8 p.m. Eastern. From the water table to our soils to the atmosphere itself, our world is becoming more and more toxic each and every day. But it's not just the air outside that's toxic. Indoor air has been shown to have two to five times higher concentrations of pollutants than even outdoor air. And most Americans spend 90% of their time inside using toxic chemicals within their homes. There are more than 42 million smokers in the United States. Well over a thousand types of mold and mildew linked to numerous conditions. And don't forget the fact that six million Americans 
Americans live with pets they're allergic to as well. When I began to research these statistics, it was clear to me it was time to start cleansing my lungs in order to combat the toxic environment that we cannot escape but that we can fight back against. Made with organic and wild cultivated herbs and manufactured in the USA, the new InfoWars Life Lung Cleanse is here in a convenient spray bottle that can be brought with you throughout any toxic environment. Now available exclusively at InfoWarsLife.com or by calling toll-free 888-253-3139. You are watching the InfoWars Nightly News, which airs 7 p.m. Central at InfoWarsNews.com. And your support is helping us defend liberty worldwide.